Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Trekking Across the Universe here on the NDB Media Network. Today is February 12th, and by the way, for those of you in Southern California, it's free hamburger day at Carl's Jr. Get Woo! the app. Okay, yeah, we're shilling. Oh, no. Yeah, we, we, we get nothing for it, but there's still time, there's still daylight going out there, but I'll get inside, folks. We're just going to get to it. I'm Roger. That's Greg. That's Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, it is rare when we have not only the individual, our guest, someone that we respect and admire, but we have everything. We have a professor. We have an author, a thespian, an athlete, dare I say. I, I, I don't know what I'm missing, but we're going to ask him. Eric Pierpoint, thank you for joining us, sir, and welcome to the program. All right, I'm really glad to be here. Good to see you guys. All right, fire away. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm sure my hosts have a few questions, but I do want to welcome Arc Four uh, Fifty Four in the chat room, and we already have a like from author, hey, a fellow author, Bobby Nash. Thanks, Bobby. Why don't you go ahead and uh, drop off some questions? But uh, oh my goodness, so I, I, darn it, I have so many notes right here. Look, here we go. Arc Fifty Four says, "Good evening. I'm so thrilled you're doing this." And I think the first question would be. What did it feel like for you as a young person to meet all the important people you met when you went with your stepfather on government interviews? Oh, wow. Oh. Oh, okay. Ooh, she's done some research. Yeah. yeah. Someone knows what's going on. Okay. Put us to shame already. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. So uh, my stepfather was a, you know, a White House news correspondent. And yes. I never knew who he was. I, in fact, well, this is kind of a funny uh, bit, but uh, when I first saw him, I remember my mother saying, pointing him out on TV, and he was on the then the Douglas Edwards show before he was on Cronkite a lot. And he says, "Oh, uh, and that and that's your Uncle Bob." And right at that time, I had a doctor visiting the house to give me a penicillin shot right in the butt. So I turned my head. The guy, boom, and that was my first memory my first uh, you know of my stepfather and i used to tell him before he passed away that he was a pain in the ass ever since but I, so i was lucky in that um going from california moving to washington dc i was eight years old and uh he you know to his credit really took the bull by the horns and became a good father we had poker games at the house where democrats and republicans would get together you know political types and they would play poker and have parties and yell and laugh and that was back in the day when when they would do that and then shake hands and then go on about their business it's a little different in this world now but i used to go down to the uh white house quite a bit and they had a press room and his he had a little office in the press room and uh, he also had, there was also a tennis court. So I became a good tennis player. So I was sort of like a ringer and <laughs> got to play yeah. with him against other political figures and correspondents on the tennis court there. But I also met presidents. Uh, I remember uh, Lyndon Johnson coming into the room and uh, just this very large presence going in. Um, uh, Kennedy was just running for office when I uh, uh, got to know my stepfather. And so once in a while, I had the luxury of being able to travel on the White House presidential press plane. Oh, so we would go to Florida or Texas or eventually uh, I went back out to California when I was in college during the uh, uh, Nixon administration and go out there. But uh, it was fascinating because one of the re routines at night always was uh, the six o'clock news. And if my dad was in town, we'd all gather around and watch the news. And oftentimes he was off in the world following the president around reporting on everything. So just to get back to your question, it was a fascinating upbringing and so completely different from what it, you know, starting out as this, you know, I grew up in nothing but orange trees and you know, California and, and Little League, you know. So this this was a whole a whole new game back there. Well, that is true. I mean, I've grown up in D.C. all my life, and um, 
My mother worked in the Senate for a senator from New Jersey. So I was exposed to a lot of that stuff too. I mean, I saw the senator quite a bit when she had to go work on Saturday. I'd hang out with her on Saturday and, and the senator would be there working and doing his little. So I understand. And it, it is, it's a different life in yeah. California. It's, it's, and, and people don't understand it. They don't live out here that they just, they just don't understand what goes on. I mean, I heard about a lot of things during the Vietnam war because my mother would come home. She was directly involved with helping constituents from New Jersey that were having, uh, like their son was missing or things yeah. like that. And she would, you know, which a lot of this, I did not realize until after she, uh, retired, but I mean, he knew all the big wigs at the Pentagon. I had no idea. And, and, uh, you know, with all that stress she had back then, it caught up with her later in life, but she would tell me stories later that it was like, I was going, really, that was going on. <laughs> so I can just imagine some of the things that, that you, you were exposed to when you were. Well, uh, you remember, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the, uh, that whole everything. And, it, and back then people were building bomb shelters in their yards. Oh yeah. And my mother had a plan. My father said, uh, okay, when the missiles start coming in from Cuba or wherever, uh, this is your plan. You're going to go to this place in Virginia, in the country, mm -hmm. and hopefully, what, survive. Mm -hmm. And it came down to like a, a last minute thing. And uh, we, we really thought we were going to be heading out there. We used to have, uh, you know, cans of food in the basement in, in case. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that was, uh, it, it was a, a really scary time. But uh, the people, you know, used to hang the Christmas wreaths on the snorkels that came up from the bomb shelters and, <laughs> yeah. you know, and Halloween decorations. Mm -hmm. It was bizarre. Bizarre and hoping for better. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we actually have a follow-up. So if this were a press conference, Eric, <laughs> we already had our first follow-up. And it is also from Art. And we're going to go to our the co-host as well for other questions. But with that kind of background, what made you choose acting over media news? That's a good question. Uh, I was uh, interested in the news, but just as it wasn't really what my main interest was. I was, uh, I was in college. I didn't take a theater course, an acting course until I was a senior. I was a, I was an athlete. I was on the ball field all the time. And so I was doing things like a liberal arts education, philosophy, history, but I finally, I, I would sign up for acting classes and then I would cancel because I was something in me said, oh no, I, I was a little afraid of it. And then I finally said, you know, what the heck? So I took a class and I walked out on stage. I was doing a, a play and I walked out on stage and no one was around. And it was just me alone on stage. And I went, oh, I'm home. You know, huh. it it was as simple as that. I said, this is what I want. Now, when I graduated and told my my stepfather, who was in visiting uh, the Western White House, uh, and I told him I was so excited. I said, I'm going to be an actor. I've, I've decided that's what I'm going to do. He said, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> that, he said, that's a horrible profession. Uh, you're going to be miserable. You're never going to make a living. And if you're not a big star, you're a complete failure. You know, so that, that was, wow. so he basically talked me out of it. And my response was I had $900 to my name saved up. I, I took it and I hitchhiked around Europe for the summer. I lasted about two or three months, came home. I didn't have a pot to pee in really. And I, I just didn't know what to do. I did get a job giving guided tours at the Lincoln Memorial in the park service. I got transferred to an arts workshop at an, uh, an old amusement park that had been almost abandoned, taken over by the park service. Glen Echo. Exactly. Glen Echo. Right. Wow. I was just there the other day. <laughs> wow. Okay. So the park service took that over. So I worked there for a couple of years. Uh, in an arts program there, uh, 
uh, which was art and theater and whatever. And then they lost funding for that. I got a job managing a restaurant. I decided to go back to grad school. So I went to Catholic University and uh, got an MFA and ran a restaurant at the same time and did shows. So that's how my 20s went. Wow. Mm. Very, very intense. And I, that yeah. restaurant in Georgetown, which was called The Guards, I don't know if it's still there, but became, sure. I got hired away from that to do something on, do a restaurant on Capitol Hill. And uh, it was called The Gandy Dancer. And I eventually fired myself and just gave myself three uh, good bar shifts so that I could go to class and study. And then I got a couple of breaks. Uh, my first kind of, you know, I was doing Shakespeare, but a local agent called me and asked me if I could sell mattresses on TV. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm doing, you know, all's well that ends well right now, but yeah, I guess I could do that. And uh, so I, uh, I met with a guy, it turned out that the actor that they hired uh, before had a lisp and they didn't like that. So I ended up doing this. And then I started doing bank, banks, cars, all this stuff around DC at the same time doing classical theater. So I developed a kind of like a relationship with camera. And that took me up to New York. And then my career after I got my MFA in grad school and all that uh, began in New York. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, we have quite a few people watching us. I uh, Please let us know who you are, where you hail from. You all know I'm on the West Coast. Greg, where are you right now in the world? I'm up in Maine. Okay, you are. And, of course, we heard that Michael is out there in uh, Maryland, just outside the Beltway. Ladies and gentlemen, share where you are. It's kind of cool. It's a world theme. And uh, we're going to get to some of the other questions that ARC54 has. And, I, and before I go to Greg... I want to ask, um, in when you were an athlete in school, I believe it says that you did tennis, soccer, and wrestling. Um, you were always on the field. Did you have a favorite, or it was just a straight-up physical competition? That well, it, I, uh, I loved it. I also played football when I was younger than high school. So through, like, ninth grade, uh, I, I loved football a lot. Um, but I realized that by the time I got to 10th grade, when I shifted from one school to another, football and soccer were played at the same time. So I took my talents on the, to the soccer field and did that. I, my, uh, uh, I played tennis on the team. Uh, and so just to kind of do something in between tennis and soccer, I wrestled, which was probably the worst thing <laughs> that happened because I kept tearing up my shoulder joints. So oh. when I went to college, everything got kind of, you know, siphoned off onto the soccer field. So that's what I ended up doing there. Yeah. All right. Appreciate that. Well, I'm going to have some follow up questions, but I want to bring Greg in and Bobby. Thanks. Uh, he's in Bethlehem, Georgia. As we saw folks, let us know, share, share in the love. So um, Greg, by all means, jump on mm -hmm. in brother. Thank you. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, one of the things that um, we've um, in my house is we, we love recognizing the familiar faces of people as they make their guest appearances on different shows. Um, of all of your guest roles, um, what has been your favorite? Uh, of the guest starring roles? Yeah. Oh boy, yeah, that's a. I, I... That's a lot. That's tough. <laughs> yeah. That is tough. Okay. All right. Which one was the most memorable? Yeah. There you go. Well, okay. Uh, there's so many, and some are so funny, too. But uh, recently, I really love being on Parks and Recreation. <laughs> that was really a lot of fun to do because you're around the kind of, you know, the cast was, you know, just amazing. But I've done all the Star, the Star Treks as well. So, who wouldn't want to be a Klingon at some point, right? <laughs> I think that episode was called Barge of the Dead, uh, as I remember. And uh, I have a famous story about that being pulled over by the police on the 101 freeway on the <laughs> way home after shooting. Uh, In uh, makeup, I assume. Just out, but there was like crap on my, you know, whatever. And I 
I we had filmed for like 24 hours because they had to shoot that episode out. And uh, I got it was three in the morning, and plus I had done a convention in the East Coast. Oh, so I came back. I didn't even get to sleep from all of that because my call time in the makeup chair was uh, two thirty in the morning. Oh, went straight from the airport uh, to the studio, got into Klingon makeup, shot for twenty four hours, and three o'clock in the morning the next day. Uh, we wrapped that, and I was on my way home, and the cops pulled me over, <laughs> and uh, they said, "I just," they said, "We pulled you over for weaving. Have you been drinking?" And I said, "No, I've been a Klingon." <laughs> and of course, since it's L.A., we talked about it a bit. They they did this, okay, follow my finger kind of yeah. test. I passed apparently, and he said, "Well, I can't give you." a ticket for driving while Klingon. So, all right. Uh, do you know where your planet is? I go, yeah, thank you. So I took off. So um, I guess, you know, my mind, it's like a Rolodex. You go click, 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 click. And all of these guest starring roles, I mean, it goes way back. I remember my first, uh, I guess my first foray, foray into that after I did a, a, a series called Hot Pursuit. Uh, in 1984, was to be Betty Thomas's love interest for three episode in Hill Street Blues. Wow. Okay. And Hill Street Blues was a show that was like must see TV. Do you remember that? Yes. I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. It was a real game changer. And uh, my funniest memory from that is that there are two things really. First of all, Betty Thomas is really tall. Okay. He is, I don't know, nine feet tall. And they, we had to do a, a scene where we were walking side by side. And they laid out what are called, you know, half apples, boxes, for me to walk on next to her. Okay, I'm, I'm like 5'10", but they just wanted the, you know, us to be, yeah. not only that, but... Um, I gave Betty my her first screen kiss, as far as I know. At least the director told me oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> when we were getting ready to do it, uh, he said, okay, this is what I want you to do. You go in, and we're going to roll it, but once we start rolling for a real take and not, not the rehearsal, save it. Keep kissing her, and don't break away, no matter what. You know, uh, Okay, so I did, and no one yelled cut. No cut. It went on and on, and she eventually just started to, I think she grabbed my hair and just started screaming. Stop. No <laughs> she, was, she was really fun. I really enjoyed working with her. That is cool. As a matter of fact. There's a, oh. there, okay, so I, like in Alien Nation, I used to have a stunt double there. His name was Denny. And uh, uh, Workaholics, do you know that show? Uh oh, Workaholics, I don't recall that one. Do you guys recall that one? Workaholics, uh, they hired me to play a rich guy, a, a CEO who was always doing cocaine. <laughs> and he he uh, accidentally sets himself on fire. So my stunt double from Alien Nation was hired to double me in this, and he said, What? So Eric, now they're setting you on fire, huh? Okay. <laughs> That's like, well, they're not setting me on fire. They're setting you on fire. <laughs> that is cool. Uh, I wanted to uh, turn back around before I go over to Michael. Uh, Arc 54, I guess, asked this question earlier. Do you consider Kenneth Johnson your start and a firm foundation for where your career took off? I if do. I remember correctly, he cast you in Hot Pursuit. Yeah. And then Fame, and then your break role in Alienation. Okay, uh, uh, Ken was not uh, uh, involved in fame, okay. but he uh, cast me in Hot Pursuit. And Hot Pursuit was a fugitive uh, type of series where you had a husband and wife on the run from uh, the law. She having committed a murder or been convicted of a murder she didn't commit. We ran for uh, a half a season, and unfortunately we're, we were canceled. But it did put me on the map. And... Once that happened, then 
other opportunities, you know, kind of came and went. Uh, the uh, there were some uh, writers on uh, 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 production on uh, Hot Pursuit that also went on Fame, and that's how I kind of hopped onto Fame. Uh, and then after Fame, there was other guest starring roles here and there, uh, probably a feature or two. And uh, Kenny called me up, and he's a great friend to this day. And he said, okay, I, uh, I'm going to do Alien Nation. I said, oh, the movie, you've been, on, you know, he says, yeah, we're going to do the TV version, and I want you to do it. And I said, uh, oh, you know, great. Okay, what's happening? Because I've seen the movie. The movie's really kind of cool. You know, the James Conn, Mandy Patinkin movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, let me take a look at it. So I, I looked at it and I went, oh, that sounds great. So uh, I called him back up and I said, I'm in. Sure. I said, you know, I'd love to play Sykes. And he said, no, no, <laughs> no, George. I went, oh, George. Let me look at it again. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I, when I looked at it, I thought, wow, what an amazing opportunity to inject all the stuff that I had experienced and learned as a young actor into a character that could be include classical theater, uh, comedy, whatever. It, it could, so many different uh, life experiences and, and theater experiences because he's an alien and who's to say, you know? So, I got that opportunity and I, it was a really, uh, you know, I just, I just loved that part and I loved that show. You had the chance to work opposite Gary Graham. Gary, unfortunately, I guess the, everyone has heard he passed uh, suddenly, uh, not too long ago, a couple, three weeks. And uh, it just chokes me up whenever I think about it. He was a blast to work with and we worked together, you know, he just had a, he had a sudden heart attack and that's really all the explanation that you really need to know because there's nothing else that I know. Yeah. And we laughed all the time. And he also knew um, that here I am getting to into makeup at three 30 in the morning, every morning. And he would stroll in at six and uh, you know, I've got, my cappuccino or whatever, and I'm getting my head put on, and he kind of looks in the mirror, and shakes his head, and goes, "I'm done," you know, and <laughs> head to the set. And uh, but he was a very generous uh, actor, and we had we you know to do something like that, and I'm sure a lot of the the people in makeup and Star Trek and the shows like that, uh, sci-fi shows, uh, they're especially the, the the actors who are in heavy makeup and if you're doing it every day it takes a toll yeah. and so you have to have the this sort of uplifting spirit around and gary was one of those special people that when he would come to the set you know we'd be you know one upping each other the whole time but that helped also for the relationship between the two characters uh, so you like if you had uh, Kirk, you had Spock, you know, so it's like it's this kind of dynamic uh, or or in this case a galaxy quest it was probably even more accurate because I'm the one that did Shakespeare, not Gary. Right. right. <laughs> and it's my curtain calls or whatever it is, you know, and Alan Rickman's constantly complaining about he didn't get any respect at all. There were those times when Gary and I would walk through airports and he'd get recognized and then. He'd go, oh, boy, I don't know. Okay, look, thank you guys. But, you know, this is George right over here. <laughs> He'd have to, because they wouldn't recognize me necessarily. So he always went out of his way, and he knew what I was going through and uh, how hard that was. But we just, I don't know, the, we never, uh, first of all, we never got tired of each other, that's for sure. And it was fun. He, we both made sure we had a heck of a good time doing that. As a personal comment, I had the privilege of interviewing Gary Graham maybe 10, 15 years ago. 
Mark Lee, a mutual contact, arranged for it. And he was on our program, and he was wonderful. He was very giving, and uh, it was absolutely awesome to be on our program. And everything you said, yes, yes, and yes. It's just so sad that he went so young. Yeah. But uh, I'm taking time. I want to bring Michael in on it, and then uh, Greg as well. So I think we still have a few more questions in the chat room as well. And as a matter of fact, uh, ladies and gentlemen, just want to let you know we're moving along here. We have Eric Pierpoint on with us. Uh, what has he not done? I'm sure he'll tell us shortly. But <laughs> I want to hand it on over to Michael and fire off your questions in the chat room. Thank you for joining us. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, well, I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about your books. Oh, um, yeah, if I may have to. Because <laughs> we did that before we went on air, but we want to yes. get that <laughs> while we're on air so you, you have, might want to mention the hero worship too <laughs> well, i'm trying not to mention well i guess we should i'll do we that later. I'll, about, I'll get him on that one <laughs> well okay that'll be your question roger yeah um, sure but um <laughs> so you you have written so far two books and they're basically i would categorize them since i did work in an elementary school library um uh, historical fiction yeah and um could you just t tell our readers kind of, so I think if I remember correctly, they said like third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Yeah. Middle grade. Approximately? I would ca call the age group about nine to 13. That would oh. be what I just said. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's a good thing. And can you tell us a little bit about um, the books? Kind of the lead up to that and how it happened. Oh, uh, that, Hey, that'd be great. Yeah. So I, I, uh, my manager called me one time, I'd written a couple of screenplays that had, you know, they were sitting around, but she asked me if I had an idea for a Western. And I thought, well, yes, uh, I can come up with one. And I did. And uh, I had my family background is like so a lot of my relatives, uh, ancestors came across on the Oregon Trail back in the 1835 era. And so there were some diaries hanging around, but I, I developed uh, this short story in my head and I wrote a screenplay for the Hallmark Channel, which they optioned. And it, they stopped doing their, their movies of the week. And so my manager said, why don't you turn it into a novel? And my first reaction was no, uh, because that's too much work. <laughs> and then we talked about it and I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll write the first 50 pages kind of based on the screenplay, but, you know, from the point of view of the 12 year old boy. And uh, that's, that was in the, in the screenplay. And so I wrote 50 pages and an agent read it and she uh, of course uh, turned it down, but with good notes. And I said, well, based on the notes, I, as an actor, I can take direction. So I can do that as a writer. And I said, let me rewrite. And I took my dog. I went to uh, Kansas, where the, the story starts out. And I covered the ground uh, that the characters would have traveled, in this case, uh, in 1877. And um, came up with all kinds of amazing things and took photographs and just wrote and gave the agent uh, the 50 pages. And she read it. And she says, oh, wow okay, you can do this. So this was November of that year. And uh, she said, well, when can I have the whole book? Can I have it by the first of the year? I'm like, oh, <laughs> wow. Okay, no, uh, that's two months. Okay, so give me till February. So I wrote the rest of the book in three months. I gave it to her and she says, this is great. I'm going to represent it. Now rewrite it. So we went through a rewriting process with her. She found a publisher uh, and then found the one publisher that uh, really connected with it. And he said, I'm going to, I'm going to buy it. And uh, we'll do a, a two book deal with the one uh, with the third option. Now rewrite it. So I rewrote a little bit according things like, you know that chapter? You don't need that. I go, that chapter took two months to write, but okay, <laughs> you know. Well, okay, so I launched that book, and then I went on a book tour uh, all around the area that the book covers. 
And oh. ended up winning the Book of the West uh, Reading Award uh, for uh, children's literature, uh, which was a huge thing. You know, it's like a real, really, that happened? Wow. So then the next book was, uh, I thought, well, what about a kid who gets a secret message that he's got to take all the way to George Washington in the Revolutionary War? So I went to Virginia, and then I started, you know, unpacking all kinds of historical stuff. I talked to historians. I had a, enough written, but I had great conversations. And again, I sort of like live in that world uh, as a tourist, kind of like in private investigator, you know. Uh, and then that one uh, went out there. And so the third book now is a Civil War story about two boys who end up on an ironclad ship uh, in the Battle of Vicksburg uh, mm -hmm. on the Union ship. And uh, so I am in the middle of that one, and I'm looking to go to Mississippi uh, when the weather gets better. And, uh, yeah. you know, kind of like, again, do the same sort of process. But I love, I really love going to going on school visits. I would have like auditory, an auditorium full of a whole mess of kids sitting across the on the floor and doing like a PowerPoint presentation, but just bringing up volunteers like frontier medicine. And this is how you saw off of, you know, you know so things that they would connect with. But there is also, you know, characters that they never would have read about in history. I find in the previous countries. Uh, and then the boy is usually a central, you know, 12 year old boy is the hero, but his sidekick in both books so far with one 15 year old sister and the other 16 year old uh, daughter of the, uh, the spot. And so the one in George Washington gets the message to George Washington so that there's the boy and the girl, and the, the girl is kind of like the, she's got, she's you know, really, really smart and kind of also adds her strengths to the story. So it's usually the two of them together. Now, in this case, the third book is the two boys. If I may, I want to show the images, folks. The Last Ride of Caleb O'Toole, it is available on Amazon, but you may also be able uh, to go to his website. Uh, it's uh, ericpierpoint.com, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we're doing ericpierpoint.net right now. Oh, I, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes ericpierpoint.net, and there's a second book, The Secret Mission of William Tuck. So you can find them. They're readily available on Amazon, and uh, check it out, folks. And Great. if you Thank purchase you. it tonight, tonight during the program, let us know. Uh, that's really cool. Michael, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just, have, so just to tell people also, I we do have um, Eric's um, uh, accounts listed down at the bottom. Some of yes. them are rather long. If you just go to ndbmedia.net under Trekking Across the Universe, um, you can, I've got all of his webpage listed on our webpage. So you can just one click and, and go to wherever you want if you can't write down all this other stuff. Now, let me, this just went past the book brigade. Oh, well, that was a, a, a book where I was, um, people were contributing money uh, and what we did was we got books to underserved schools. And we ran that for a while. It, it, it hasn't been active uh, lately. Oh, okay. So it's not active. Should I take that down then from the... Uh, uh, I Well, we can always touch base later with that. If, uh, but at this point, we, you know, it's been, I sense during COVID, I think uh, we haven't been doing that. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to go to Greg in a moment. Uh, we have an additional comment. Uh, this is a personal one. As someone who's involved with Big Sisters, this is Liz. She wanted to say thank you for oh. your work with Big Brothers of L.A. It really does make a huge difference in these young boys' lives. I tell you, Liz, thank you. I did not know that either. Eric, thank you for that. This is something that I've debated doing, but I haven't. I yeah. admire the fact that you've done so, sir, and I thank you. This that's really cool. It's an awesome program. It is. Uh, it really was wonderful uh, for me, and I was wow. in my early forties when I did it. Uh, they, I, for some reason, I just you know I'd done enough charity work, like you know you make a wish foundation things, but I got interested in Big Brothers, and I um, interviewed with them, and. They pulled out of 
someone in the file and they said, um, we're going to give you the hardest case. You know, and here's a young boy who um, never had never met his father. And uh, so his mom had signed him up. And so I remember meeting him. He was nine years old. And uh, we went out for pizza. And he kind of understood that he was very quiet, very quiet, you know. Uh, and I said, okay, you can fire me anytime, but you told him that I told him that Yeah, I said, you can, if this doesn't work for you, we'll all talk about it. Don't worry about it. But what's your favorite pizza? Right. <laughs> so <laughs> it started like that. And then our, I picked him up every Saturday for seven years and, uh, with, is in his life for a long time. In fact, I'm still in his life a little bit. He's now 40. Uh, he has two kids and he's doing well. Uh, but we hung out. Our routine was I'd pick him up. We would go to a, like a local, uh, you know, uh, coffee shop. We would have almost always the same thing to eat. And he was like a bottomless pit, but you know, it, then we would go play basketball after the stack of pancakes or whatever. Of course. And then we would go to the movies and then I'd take him home. And it went like that for a number of years. And eventually uh, I said, well, how would you like to, I'm going to go skiing. You want to go? And talk to his mom. And he, of course, never been. He'd never been up in the snow before. And uh, so... I was driving him up and he, uh, uh, we pulled over at one point and he wanted to know if there was where we were going to stay. And I said, it's a little cabin and, uh, you know, it's, it's got a fireplace. It's, you know, it's in the ski resort area called Mammoth. And he said, is there a TV there? And I said, oh no, no, there's no TV. There. <laughs> I'm horrified that now he's trapped and there's no TV. Well, we went up there, I put him in like a ski school and he went out with an instructor and I could watch him from a distance and see if he could like not kill himself. And uh, I taught him how to play poker and he was all about that. And so we played poker, we read from Call of the Wild, you know, and that's how it went. The next year he said, can we go skiing again? And I said, yeah, he says, can I bring my best friend? And I went, okay. So along comes his best friend. Same conversation in the back of the car now. Where are we staying? Oh, we're staying in this cabin. Is there a TV there? No, we don't watch TV when we go up to the mountains. So this the last time I saw him was a few years ago. I was coming back from Montana, and uh, I just happened to uh, decide to stop by, and and we spent some time together. And, I, uh, you know, it was just – I think it's a really great – it's an amazing program. It's a great experience, and it was really good for me and and uh, my little brother, who's now a man uh, and a dad. And and good things can happen, you know. Thank you for sharing that, Eric. That means a lot to us and to our audience as well. Greg, please, and folks, uh, we need to get your questions in. Uh, we are running out of time, so let's get your questions, comments. I still have another question, but Greg, go ahead, buddy. You, unfortunately, oh, you, you've had short shrift. <laughs> Sorry, brother. So be, because you have a very recognizable voice, <laughs> as, um, we noticed that you have done semi-local ads up in Maine. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Uh, you're talking about the law firm ads, are the you? Law firm ads. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and not only me, William Shatner is doing them. Yes. Right. So, a uh, marketing company got a hold of me and um, asked me if I would do a demo for them. And I had done a, I was a spokesperson for an ad campaign that Shredded Wheat was doing so about 15 years ago. And it ended up winning a, a like a bronze lion award in, in the can festival, but they did a demo and then they got me on board 
and once a year uh, we they come out either i go back there to like massachusetts or they come out here and we they were just here a few weeks ago and we do these uh, uh personal injury uh law firm commercials in states like west virginia maine georgia you know whatever so it's been a really yeah, it's actually kind of fun to do uh, I don't think they show in New York or L.A., but I'm glad you have them up there. And once in a while, my face goes by on a bus. Have you seen that yet? <laughs> I don't know if I've seen it on the bus yet. <laughs> yeah, or a billboard or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's back to mattresses, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. That's cool. Yeah. So how many do you, like, I, I know it's like a group. How many of these ads do you do in, a, like, a session? I would say the number of firms that use me, uh, there may be eight. And they will, they're, they're called buyout situations. So they come and they buy the ad, they, you know, they're me doing their firm and they can run it as many times as they want locally uh, for that. It's not a residual based kind of uh, production. A flat fee. Kind of. It's a flat fee. It's a buyout. Yeah. Uh, so, that's how that works. And, and um, I'm hoping that, you know, my face doesn't fall down below my knees anytime soon that I can keep going. <laughs> um, I want to give a quick shout out to Tony Kanapka. Thank you for the love. Elizabeth Olivia Cooper. And of course, he aforementioned Bobby Nash. Jag has a question. Uh, well, first comment, then a question. Uh, you're one of those gifted performers that people may not remember or know, but you're like everywhere. I just realized you weren't liar, liar. And yeah. you look the same. How oh. was that the film experience? And I would add, you were in the Revenge of the Fallen. And I remember you from there in that one. <laughs> yes, but anyway, if a Jag's question, a liar, liar. Yeah, liar, liar. Okay, um, that was about 20, I want to say like 28 years ago. Uh, and the fact that you think I look the same is, thank you over, I can't thank you enough for saying that. <laughs> Because I've, I've got a movie coming up that I'm going to do where, uh, as an older person, I fall and get knocked on the head and end up in a home someplace. So, okay. But going back to Liar Liar, uh, that was, um, I, you know, I did not know what to expect. Jim Carrey was probably the hottest actor around at that point. And I didn't know uh, what I was getting myself into but I was cast as they were getting ready to start and I was moving at the same time, but I get on set and immediately, it, you know, Jim Carrey is a kind of a guy, he, did, he never did anything the same time. He never did the same thing twice. And so the editor was there, the director's there and he, he made the whole thing kind of like his own sandbox, you know, he could just do anything. And, and, it's so hard not to constantly crack up uh, while he's doing it. And I remember asking the director, I said, you know, I feel like, am I being funny enough for you? He goes, oh, God, Eric, no, please don't try to be funny. You're just going to ruin it all. You know, it's just, <laughs> you're not hired to be funny. You're hired to be the straight guy in this. OK, so <laughs> you please don't try to be funny. It'll just come off wrong. So uh, not that I could have taken a whole lot of attention away from him, you know, but it was, it went on and on because I remember, he, I think at one point he, he left LA to get married or something and then came back. And so uh, it seemed like the longest courtroom scene, scene ever, but uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And he, he, that movie runs all the time. It seems, you know, it's like one of those classic, movies that you know if you want to have a laugh you just maybe you have it on you know recorded on your you know dvr or whatever and go i feel like laughing i'm going to put that on that's what i've done wow that's cool that's that's good to know that, that's a funny that is a funny movie i wanted to get a question in that in i'm not sure if it was on amazon or your web page but uh, for the last ride of caleb o'toole you went on the oregon trail yeah, and you, I believe it's mentioned that you had, uh, well, you have a connection to the Oregon Trail. Did your family come? Your ancestors? Yeah. Come so, uh, please, my family, uh, 
they migrated, I guess you could say, on the Oregon Trail in around 1835. Uh, and they were also, a lot of them were Mormons, and they ended up settling in Utah. Uh, and uh, so when they came across, I have uh, diaries uh, from very, very uh, rugged, violent times of what happened to them. And uh, one, in fact, uh, if you've got any uh, people who are, are curious about uh, that kind of history, uh, there are pages from uh, what's called the Hans Mill Massacre, which uh, took place, I believe, in Missouri, where the Missouri militia and uh, basically came into the camp and murdered all of the men, men and men. And they were going to come back and desecrate the bodies, and the women threw the bodies down a well to keep them from being, uh, you know, desecrated. So, on a lighter note, um, because that is some serious stuff that happened way back then, I just became fascinated how how uh, you know the survive how to survive, say all of the dangers of, of the Oregon Trail. And I took a horseback ride in the, along there that lasted a day, I remember, and up through in the Yellowstone area too, where the book also goes. And it was the most exciting thing to be out there with nothing except a bottle of water and a map. And it so stimulated my imagination. I, you know, I looked up at one point and I, I saw eagles teaching the young ones how to fly from a nest and I just sat there on a horse and I'm going, okay, something in here is making sense. You know, uh, you feel it, it kind of like, you want to feel it in your blood in a way, sort of like the, you, you feel like you should have like a, you know, some kind of a rifle or a gun or something, which I didn't, but uh, it was, uh, it, it, it was really something else. Plus the vistas and to be able to go out and to, to take photos and to write and to, and to just get a sense of what they may have gone through, uh, you know, making sometimes two or three miles a day or maybe 10 miles a day. Um, we're going to sneak one last question, if I may. This is from Tony Kanopka. We may have talked about it a little bit. I apologize. Tony may have come in a little bit late. My favorite TV show of all time is Alienation. The chemistry among the cast was so amazing. Eric, what was your experience like on set with the cast? I know you mentioned a little bit in the dressing room, but uh, especially with Gary and in your unique makeup. Hopefully we didn't go over that already. Or if, or if we did, um, go back and listen. That's all right. There's a couple of things uh, that we didn't go over that I'll mention, uh, which was, uh, first of all, uh, glad that you mentioned Gary. I'll talk with a, a little bit about him again and how delightful it was to work with him. And, uh, you know, he, there, there couldn't, it's all like there couldn't have been a George, the same George without the Sykes that Gary did and vice versa. So we, we uh, you know, we just kind of invented a lot. And the cast coming in, it was such a tight group. Um, we still, like, I just got together with some, uh, a couple of, well, about two weeks ago for lunch. I don't know where. Because Ken Johnson, who is our producer, uh, set it up. I was over at Ken Johnson's house for Christmas. You know, that's how tight we were. But other fun things is like, okay, the writers come in one day and they say, Eric, uh, you're going to have a baby. That's right. And I forgot about that. Yeah, right. that's right. I forgot about All that. Right, let's, have, let's have a baby. No, you're going to have the baby. I go, Right, good. Okay, so uh, what? You know? <laughs> no, you're going to have the baby. I go, how? Well, it's going to be in your pouch. I have a pouch? You know? So they, we went through this whole, of course, they have to build the culture. They have to build the fact that men give birth and there's a transfer of the pod. And then it takes two males to impregnate a female. I mean, all of this stuff. And it was just, I mean, it was so inventive. Uh, 
it just and we really spoke to the level of diversity and you could you could talk about so many things because uh, that's that's what the show the world's newest minority and I have one special experience having doing a, a an off-broadway play in New York and then at night at midnight or whatever it was or actually more like two in the morning after after a midnight dinner uh, being in the subway and being recognized which is always surprises me because I was in the head but everyone you know in the car looking at me in the subway car and I got oh huh I think I might know what this is about finally a woman looked over and she said you're that guy aren't you and you it had every racial all the whole mix inside black hispanic asian inside that car and that what they felt was this show spoke to them and uh so i went way up beyond my stop because i was having such interesting conversations with the people in the subway car at two o'clock in the morning that, that is awesome that that is look um we know you're short on time you have another commitment um uh, michael is a comment or anything greg any comments only no more questions <laughs> well, okay. before i go oh. i want to tell you about hero worship oh okay folks i wanted to make a comment i apologize to eric before we began and i said i'm sorry sir if there's hero worship i had to set it up please go ahead <laughs> this is where humility comes into the picture so i'm having lunch staring at the pacific ocean last summer and i'm just enjoying it and uh there were two couples in a table near me and uh older you know probably in the early 80s and as they passed my table the woman trailing looks at me and she says are you a movie star and i said oh, i've probably been in your living room a lot over the years and she looks at me and she studies me and she says, well, you were very good in whatever it was you might have been in. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to go down my resume and tell her what I'd been in, but that was enough for me that she somehow I was in her brain, but maybe not at the tip of her tongue, right? <laughs> so that's that my hero cool. worship. <laughs> uh, I get that, and I appreciate that. We do have a comment, but no, all kidding aside, folks, look, we're obviously going to invite Eric back. We're going to, I'm sorry, Mr. Pierpoint, <laughs> when we have a chance uh, to talk about his forthcoming book and any other project, he would so kindly love to spend time with us. Yeah, well, we, we, we're enthralled. We are. Uh, when I mentioned professor, author, thespian, athlete, I forgot to mention theater, Young man, everything you've done, you're a renaissance man. A Swiss love Army you more. Like Swiss it. Army <laughs> Knife. I like that. <laughs> I like that even better. I just so, thought of that. that. That's absolutely awesome. So uh, on behalf of everyone, yes, Tony uh, says thank you so much for sharing and for all of your amazing work. Yes. All right. On behalf of them, uh, Michael, anything else? No, that, okay. that's good. Yeah. All right. Greg? Thank you for your memorable performances, and thank you for joining us tonight. Yes. Uh, thanks, Greg, Roger, Michael. It's good to good to be with you. All right, folks. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead, and we're probably going to take a few more minutes. Eric, if you wanted to stay on with this, of course you can. Otherwise, don't hit the end, the end stream button. You could hit the leave studio button. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. I, I probably have to jump off at this point. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm hitting. What am I hitting to leave you guys, or should I just close the computer? Close can, the computer, but do don't that. hit end stream. <laughs> I'm not going to do anything that's going to mess you up. Okay, you're good. Close the computer. All right, thank you, back. sir. It was a pleasure. All right, right. have a thank great night. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Oh, thank you. Wow. Okay, I believe we did lose them. Okay, we may not have, so I'm going to go and remove them at this point. Yeah. So there it is. All right. Well, there you go, Michael. Oh, no, I'm up there. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, you are. Ladies and gentlemen, um, what a treat. It was a treat for us, and uh, I can only imagine. Uh, hopefully, he'll come back and join us when he has his other items uh, coming out. Yeah, that was amazing. 
it was he was amazing. <laughs> it was not so. I could listen wow. to him talking about those diaries. It's like, wait a minute, why did we save that for last? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I wanted to get that in because it had men- it had been mentioned that, on that his website awesome. as well as Amazon. I'm glad said, you Dude, did. You you went on the Oregon Trail. Wow, that was cool, and I'm glad he was able to regale us. I think there is more in just those diaries that he can oh, tell us. I think I think so too. I mean, I, I think he just touched the surface when he was on the Oregon Trail. Yeah, I mean, but hmm. that image of him being out there—what do you say? A water bottle and uh, a compass. Yeah, <laughs> or map. He said map. Or a map. Yes. Well, I know I, what I he was talking about it. with the eagles too, because I used to sit and watch the ospreys build nests, and it's just fun, you know, watching that rare nature type of event. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, I, I did thank everyone. Sorry, Greg. Jag, Tony, Art, um, Bobby, your comments are appreciated. It mean a lot. And when you ask questions, again, it's not us. It's you guys asking the questions as well. And when we see good questions, we're going to go to them. So, uh, damn, Liz, you were prepped for this one. <laughs> you got two. Uh, did she get two? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> so I think she got three, actually. She may have gotten three, yes. Uh-huh. So I, I think she got this one this time. Uh, uh, Tony says, well, I'll go back and watch this from the beginning. I'm a Definitely. Teacher. Yeah, you know, I, he did mention some stuff, but he was so awesome that he was able to still add other stuff to it. Um, guys, yeah, they're... they're yeah, I, I, I hope he's able to return again. So, but be that as it may, I'm not sure if I put that comment up. Um, yeah, I told you guys I was a huge fan. Yeah, no kidding. I did research, and I didn't know that he was part of the uh, the the um, the program that he talked about, the Big Brother of Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah, Big Brothers of L.A., yes. I, I remember my thinking I wanted to do that for a while, but... Folks, that's close as I got. Just thinking about it, he actually did it, and knowing that he's still For seven in years, contact, seven yeah, years. but he's still in contact with the young mm-hmm. man who mm-hmm. is now a, a grown man himself with family. That is so cool. All right, that's well, cool. yes. Um, I don't know if Greg has any comments, but Michael, we do have. Do we have a guest confirmed for next week? Yes, we do. Um, confirmed yes. as much as we can. Um, that would be Bill Blair. He's done a lot of science fiction also, a lot of creature work. And he will be on a little bit earlier. He will be 7 p.m. Eastern time, yes. 4 p.m. Pacific time, because he is on the East Coast and, and he has commitments also. Yes. Um, so, so that's why we had to move it up for him. But we, uh, we're welcome to do that because he's got a big resume too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will go through – I will – put it out there real quick that Eric had committed to be on two weeks ago, but with the passing of Gary Graham, I can say this, Michael and I suggested to him his, Hey man, we didn't know how tight you were. We didn't realize it didn't dawn on us. And we threw it to the agent and they immediately responded and said, immediately. Yes. And the thing about it was, this is professionalism on another level, folks. Yeah. They said, thank you. We'll see you in two weeks. They didn't ask us. They said, we'll see you in two weeks. And they gave the date. And we were like, wow. We're glad we were able to accommodate. And this is the two weeks later. This was absolutely awesome. Um, yeah. That's awesome. So, I don't know, Greg. Oh, um, back to Galactica this Thursday. We will be reviewing. Oh, my goodness. Um, I think it's. Commander Kane. Yep. Command the living legend. So we will be reviewing parts one and two. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, this one ought to be fun. There was a lot to this one. Every episode has been fun. But we thank you for staying on with us. Uh, Greg, any announcements or comments? No. We'll see you Thursday night. All right. Thank you. And um, Michael, anything else? No, I think that's that's it for tonight. Folks, please head on over to ndbmedia.net. 
please give us a like and subscribe. And if you want to ring our bell, we do know when you do. So uh, it's very much appreciated. <laughs> so folks, all kidding aside, this was as if it was fun for you. Can you imagine? It was fun for us as well. Thanks for being on with us. And again, to Mr. Eric Beerpoint. Wow. There's more there. I would love, I would love to be privileged to hear some more. All right, guys. We'll see you guys on the other side. Peace!